Perched high in a tree, clinging to a branch, a man sits. He has been there for over two hours. Spear in hand, prey in mind, he waits with patience. For he knows below him lies a popular path, a path which horses often take in the afternoon. They move from the plains into the forest to get a drink. He is not alone. In adjacent trees, his brother and cousin wait. On the ground, two friends are concealed in the grass. They have been waiting for this hunt for a number of days, honing their tools, practicing their throws, and most importantly, planning. They know who will throw the first spear, when to jump out of the grass, and even how the horses will react to such an attack. But the horses never come. As they finally leave their post and head home, they see a group of homotherium feasting on a young horse. Despite all their efforts, today in middle Pleistocene Europe, Braun has beat Brain. But this group has had great success in the past, and they will continue to have it in the future. Homo heidelbergensis has long been a mysterious human species. What they accomplished and their relation to other hominins has puzzled researchers for many years. As more discoveries are made, we are learning they are an incredibly important milestone in human evolution. Even in the past few weeks, many Homo heidelbergensis have now been reclassified as a new species, Homo bodoensis. It is uncertain if the term heidelbergensis will even be used anymore. But regardless, this video covers the Middle Pleistocene hominins of Africa and Europe. All the way back in the Middle Pleistocene, they were laying the groundwork for our own dominance. They created major advancements in tools, hunting, fire, and language. They are essential in understanding the story of our ancestors. So without further ado, let's get into the fifth installment of the Ancient Human series. The first fossil of this species was discovered by a worker in Mauer, southeast of Heidelberg, Germany in 1907. It was then formally described the next year by German anthropologist Otto Schotensack. He determined it to be a type specimen of a new species, Homo heidelbergensis. This jaw was different enough from Neanderthal or sapien specimens due to its archaicness. The most telling feature was its overall massive size a trait typically associated with lower Pleistocene hominins. The jaw is in great condition for being over 600,000 years old. It belonged to a young adult. Later in 1921, a skull named Cobway I was discovered by a Swiss miner in Zambia. It was then assigned a new species, Homo rhodesiensis. These two names were part of a trend at this time in paleoanthropology. Everything that looked different was given its own name. Towards the middle of the 20th century, it became apparent that specimens could be grouped together in more variable species. But grouping together different populations that are separated by thousands of miles and years is a difficult task. Specifically its distinction from late erectus and upper Pleistocene hominids. In comparison to early Pleistocene erectus and ergaster remains, Middle Pleistocene humans have a much more human-like face. They have a nasal opening that is set vertically in the skull. The frontal bone is broad, the parietal bone is often expanded, and the squamous part of the temporal bone is high and arched. All of these features indicate that the skull was accommodating for an increase in brain size. Despite a more modern face, they retain a number of more archaic traits. They lacked a chin like almost all other hominins. Their brow ridge was very prominent and their jaws were huge. This makes sense considering both of these features were still smaller than that of Erectus, thus a notable trend can be observed. As mentioned earlier, their brain size was noticeably higher than previous hominins. A study in 2004 estimated the brain volumes of 10 middle Pleistocene hominins attributable to Heidelbergensis. Out of the 10 skulls studied, an average of about 1,206 cubic centimeters was found. The skulls ranged from 1,100 to 1,390 cubic centimeters. 
In comparison, modern humans have a brain size typically between 1200 and 1400 cubic centimeters. So it is safe to say some individuals would have had slightly larger brains than some modern humans. But of course size doesn't always correlate to intelligence. Even in modern humans, the smartest people do not necessarily have the biggest brains. These people were certainly smart, but were undoubtedly less intelligent than anatomically modern humans. In the same study, the brain volumes of 30 erectus and ergaster specimens across East Asia and Africa were studied. This yielded an average of 970 cubic centimeters. Since Heidelbergensis almost certainly descended from erectus or gaster, this shows us a significant jump in brain size. Besides their skulls, their postcranial remains are also quite interesting. Unfortunately, our knowledge of their body size is obscured due to a lack of limb bones. Based on what we have, males averaged around 169.5 centimeters or 5 foot 7. Females were shorter at 157 centimeters or 5 foot 2. A tibia from Cobway is typically estimated to have been 180 centimeters or 5 foot 11. It is among the tallest middle Pleistocene specimens, but it is possible that this individual was either unusually large or had a much longer tibia to femur ratio than expected. They are not very heavy, but on par with modern humans of the same height. Males averaged around 62 kilograms or 136 pounds. Females were smaller at an average of 51 kilograms or 112 pounds. It is noteworthy to say Heidelbergensis displayed a level of sexual dimorphism to a higher degree than in modern humans. Although we don't have very many long bones, one of the long bones we do have from this species is conspicuously large. The massive upper half of a femur recovered from Berg Ockus mine, Namibia, was originally estimated to have been as much as 93 kilograms or 205 pounds in life. That would almost be twice the weight of an average Homo heidelbergensis. But the exorbitant size is now attributed to intense activity level while maturing. The Bergakis individual was probably proportionally similar to other known remains. Early modern humans, which are now thought to be descended from Bodoensis, which is just reclassified Heidelbergensis, were notably taller. The school in Kafsa remains averaged 185 centimeters or 6 foot 1 inches for males and 169 centimeters or 6 foot 7 inches for females. 6 foot 1 is still quite tall for modern humans and it is fascinating male remains average this height. The human body plan had evolved in Erectus or Gaster, but among the more derived members there are two distinct morphs. A narrow chested and gracile build like modern humans and a broader chested and robust build like Neanderthals. These two builds are now known as early Neanderthals and Homo bodoensis. Homo bodoensis is the name of a new species based on remains which were previously considered Homo heidelbergensis. The other hominins from Europe are now largely considered early Neanderthals rather than Homo heidelbergensis. It was once assumed that the Neanderthal build was unique to Neanderthals based on the gray style Homo ergaster turcana, but the discovery of some Middle Pleistocene skeletal elements seems to suggest Middle Pleistocene humans overall featured a more Neanderthal-like morph. Thus, the modern human morph may be unique to modern humans and our closest ancestors, evolving quite recently. Homo heidelbergensis is one of the most enigmatic species in paleoanthropology. This is because it lived during the Middle Pleistocene, a time often referred to by paleoanthropologists as the muddle in the middle. This is because the remains that are currently known left us with many questions about our ancestors. Basically what we know happened during the Middle Pleistocene is that more archaic hominins like Homo erectus and related forms gradually evolved into the species of the Upper Pleistocene. This means that many Middle Pleistocene hominins were transitional in nature. And because we see traits that are shared between different groups and we do not have the best remains, this period is heavily debated. I will present you first with our former understanding of Homo heidelbergensis's place in our family tree and then I will talk about the new classification of Bodoensis. One thing we know with relative certainty is that Heidelbergensis evolved from Homo erectus at the beginning of the Middle Pleistocene. 
Homo erectus was an amazing species that really pioneered hominin success across the world. As it spread into a vast range, populations began to diverge. First, relatively small changes created regional differences. But after hundreds of thousands of years, these adaptations built up, and notably new species formed. One of these species is of course Heidelbergensis. But hold on for a second, it's not that simple. The story gets more complicated with the discovery of Homo antecessor. The remains of what we once thought to be Homo heidelbergensis are around 800,000 to a million years old. They are the oldest remains of hominins in Europe. However, the six individuals found here indicate to anthropologists that they are different enough from heidelbergensis to be considered the same species. So that means they must be the more archaic ancestors of heidelbergensis, right? Once again, it is not that simple. Homo antecessor has been a puzzle for a paleoanthropologist to understand. Originally the flat human-like face of ATD615, also known as the boy of Grand Dolina, led researchers to believe that antecessor was more closely related to modern humans and Neanderthals than even Homo heidelbergensis. However, after much scrutiny, it is now largely regarded as an evolutionary offshoot. Its flat face and more modern-like facial features seem to be the case of convergent evolution or bias due to the young age of the specimen. As many of you may know, Homo ergaster is often considered a subspecies or subpopulation of Homo erectus. So how do Brigensis did evolve from erectus? Researchers think that they specifically evolved from erectus ergaster. The origin of Homo heidelbergensis is still very much shrouded in mystery. Like mentioned earlier, Homo erectus was the original species to colonize Eurasia. For a long time, it was thought that Hadarbergensis originated in Europe or the Near East, possibly from a migration of Erectus ergaster. However, in 2016, it was suggested that 875,000 year old remains from Ethiopia represent a transitional morph between Ergaster erectus and Hadarbergensis thus postulating that Heidelbergensis originated in Africa instead of Europe. Regardless of where exactly the species appeared, we know for sure that they are successful in the Middle Pleistocene. After originating some 7 to 800,000 years ago, their range would eventually encompass much of the Old World. They lived throughout Africa except for the Western regions. Most of Europe was conquered even as far north as the British Isles. All of the Middle East and even nearly all of Asia may have been inhabited. I say may because we are not really currently sure of how to classify some Asian remains. Namely remains from Dali and Junishan in China. Though we could confidently label them as Heidelbergensis previously, the 2010 discovery of Denisovans through the genetic code has changed our view on Asian hominins. These remains could very well belong to Denisovans or a transitory form. Also, the recent discovery of Homo longi only makes this story more complicated. Homo heidelbergensis is already confusing as is, but Asian Homo heidelbergensis is an entirely different story. For now, Middle Pleistocene Asian hominins remain shrouded in mystery. In the coming years, this will hopefully change, and for that reason, there is currently not a whole lot I can say. Most of what we know about this species comes from Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. And just when you thought that this species couldn't get any more complicated, it might not even exist. Very recently, as of October 28th, 2021, it was announced that Homo heidelbergensis may be an outdated term to be done away with. A new paper came out that proposed the aforementioned species, Homo bodoensis. Bodo 1 is a cranium discovered in Africa in 1976. It presented a complex array of modern human and Homo erectus traits. It was grouped into Heidelbergensis until relatively recently. Paleoanthropologists were frustrated with describing so much diversity as one species and instead decided on two different species. Hominins in Africa and Southeast Europe are now being reclassified as Homo bodoensis, while other hominins in Europe are being reclassified as early Neanderthals. It remains unknown what will be done with the classification of Homo heidelbergensis. It may still apply to certain hominins or be done away with altogether. Regardless, the information in this video is still relevant. The exact name of a hominin is just an arbitrary scientific name, 
What matters is who these people were, what they did, and what they left behind. First, let's talk about the most abundant evidence of these people's existence, the tools they left behind. Not all tools leave behind good remains, but stone tools certainly do. Homo heidelbergensis mainly lived during the long-spanning Acheulean tool industry. The Acheulean is characterized by the production of mostly symmetrical hand axes. This technology stagnated in the hands of Erectus, but would see some small advancements with the emergence of Heidelbergensis. Their technology is largely considered late Acheulean. The transition is indicated by the production of smaller, thinner, and more symmetrical hand axes. Some of these hand axes look to be made purely for function, while others seem to be artistic in nature. At the 500,000 year old site in Boxgrove, England, thinning may have been produced by striking the hand axe near perpendicularly with a soft hammer. This would have been nearly impossible to do by hand and a prepared platform would have been necessary. The Boxgrove knappers also left behind large lithic flakes left over from making hand axes, possibly with the intention of recycling them into other tools later. Late Acheulean sites elsewhere pre-prepared lithic cores in a variety of ways before shaping them into tools, making the prepared platforms unnecessary. With either method, nappers would have had to produce some item indirectly related to creating the desired product, which could represent a major cognitive development. Experiments with modern humans have shown that platform preparation cannot be learned through purely observational learning, unlike earlier techniques and could be indicative of well-developed teaching methods as well as self-regulated learning. Perhaps the most impressive evidence of stone working in this species comes from the Cap Thurin Formation, Kenya. The site has yielded the oldest evidence of blade and bladelet technology. The evidence dates all the way back to about 545,000 years ago. This technology is rare even in the Middle Paleolithic and is typically associated with Upper Paleolithic modern humans. Interestingly, it is unknown if this is part of a long tradition or if methods were lost and reinvented several times by multiple different human species. All of the stone tools we have talked about so far were hand axes. For those unfamiliar, hand axes were basically the pocket knives of their day. They were used for butchering animals, processing plants, and crafting other items. Besides hand axes, fire was another instrumental technology to their success. Despite living in colder climates, evidence of fire is conspicuously scarce in the archaeological record until 400 to 300,000 years ago. It is possible the evidence for these fires were lost to time, but it is quite odd that some long-term sites entirely lack evidence of fire. Since we know long-term fires were being used as far back as 700,000 years ago, we know these people were aware of this technology. The lack of evidence may actually indicate fire ignition technology. In older sites we see fires that burned for many weeks. Basically whenever hominins could harvest fire from naturally occurring wildfires they would keep them going as long as possible. Of course this would require a lot of wood and a lot of time. But if these people had a way to start fires on their own, they wouldn't need to keep one going all the time. They would simply start one when they made a big kill or needed to stay warm. This notion is interesting, although admittedly hard to prove. We know Neanderthals started their own fires as evident by iron pyrite being present on a handful of hand axes. Heidelbergensis were the Neanderthals' direct ancestors and it is reasonable to think that they could have possessed this technology, though direct evidence would have to be found. One of the most important steps these people took in advancing technology was their advancements made towards weapons. It was recently discovered that even as far back as Homo heidelbergensis, humans were hafting stone tips to their spears. In Africa, 500,000 year old sites from Kathupan 1, South Africa may be the oldest evidence of hafting in the world. The points are shaped in a way which would have made them efficient spears. When put under a microscope, their purpose is obvious. The concentration of damage is pronounced at the tip of the spear while the edges have much less wear. Comparing this evidence to experimental studies tell researchers all they need to know to confidently say that these points were hafted and used as spears. 
Attaching stone points to spears is a very important technological advancement. Stones are much harder and sharper than wood could ever be. Wood also by nature has a lot of friction and often lacks the mass needed to penetrate large game animals. Evidence of hafting in both Europe and Africa become much more common after about 300,000 years ago. Still, this technology did not exist for much of this species' existence. For a long time, Heidelbergensis primarily used sharpened sticks. The Schoenigan spears are excellent examples of such tools. They are around 330,000 years old and have miraculously survived all those years, albeit fossilized. Most of the spears are made of slow-growing spruce trees except for Spear 4, which is made from pine. The spears vary from 1.84 to 2.53 meters, or 6 to 8.3 feet in length. They were made from the bases of young trees, which are harder wood. These features indicate an awareness of the properties of wood and an experience in selecting crafting materials. Just like today's tournament javelins, the center of gravity is located in the front third of the shaft of some of the spears. In addition, most of the spears taper in an aerodynamic way except for Spear 6. Experimental research using experienced athletes to throw replicas of Spear 2 show that the spears are capable of being thrown at a distance of at least 15 to 20 meters. However, Spear 6, which does not taper at the back and also has a natural kink, is interpreted as a thrusting spear. Together, the evidence suggests that the Shonigan spears were crafted in specific ways for specific uses. Another discovery from the Shonigan site was a wooden throwing stick. The object was made with stone tools to be smooth and flat on one side. The artifact preserves impact fractures and damage consistent with that found on ethnographic and experimental examples of throwing sticks. When thrown, these sticks would have flown in an accurate straight line. These sticks are effective at killing small game and even driving large game. Australian aboriginals famously used throwing sticks called boomerangs to kill a variety of prey including kangaroos. The presence of water birds at the site has led researchers to hypothesize they were killed by these throwing sticks. It is fascinating how much you can do with simple technology. These people were smart and certainly resourceful. Homo heidelbergensis were hunters of large game. Middle Pleistocene communities in general seem to have eaten big game at a higher frequency than predecessors, with meat becoming an essential dietary component. The diet overall could be varied and certainly differed vastly between populations. They hunted a large variety of animals across their range. Horses, elephants, hippopotami, bear, aurochs, deer, ibex, boar, and more were hunted. Some of these beasts were quite large and it is impressive that they were able to kill them. Even with the stone points these people had in later times, they were still crude compared to the spears of sapiens and neanderthals. This has led researchers to believe that they were capable of a high degree of cooperation and strategy. For instance, at Toralba and Ambrona, the animals may have been run into swamplands before being killed, entailing encircling and driving by a large group of hunters in a coordinated and organized attack. With their large brains, they certainly had the capability of coordinating large and complex hunts. Though carcasses may have been simply scavenged, some Afro-European sites show specific targeting of a single species, which more likely indicates active hunting. For example, a site in Kenya has yielded over 50 to 60 individual baboons. Taralba and Ambrona in Spain have an abundance of elephant bones and larger herbivores such as rhinos. Their diet was similar to that of later Neanderthals. African sites commonly yield bovine and horse bones. The exploitation of aquatic environments is generally quite lacking, despite some sites being in close proximity to oceans, lakes, or rivers. Plants were probably frequently consumed, including seasonally available ones, but the extent of their exploitation is unclear as they do not fossilize as well as animal bones. 
Assuming a diet heavy in lean meat, an individual would have probably needed a high intake of carbohydrates to prevent protein poisoning. They would have been able to supplement their diets with tree bark, berries, nuts, and other plants. The Schoenigen site in Germany has over 200 plants in the vicinity which are either edible, raw, or when cooked. Overall, it was impressive that they were able to get their hands on so much meat. But the relative simplicity of their diet still denotes to paleoanthropologists that they were technically and cognitively less advanced than upper Pleistocene hominins. A facet of hominin life during the Pleistocene was competition with other predators and even predation. Throughout Heidelbergensis's vast range, there was a menagerie of predators. In Eurasia there lived caves, steppe, and brown bears, cave lion, and African lion, cave hyena, homotherium, leopards, and tigers. Big cats are notoriously efficient hominin killers. Powerful, stealthy, and deadly. There is no doubt that the various cats of the Middle Pleistocene dined on Heidelbergensis. But the notion that these people were constantly getting preyed upon is unfounded. In fact, predators may have often become prey for these people. At the amazing Middle Pleistocene site of Grand Delina, the bones of cave lion have intriguing cut marks. It would be easy to assume the animal was merely scavenged from a dead individual. But the cut marks present on the bones indicate that it was gutted and butchered in the same way many other animals were. Since organ meat is typically targeted first by scavengers, it wouldn't have been necessary to gut the animal if scavengers got to it first. All lines of evidence seem to indicate it was actively hunted and killed by hominins. But why would these fairly small sized men with wooden spears want to tangle with such a ferocious predator? The Maasai people of East Africa are known to actively hunt lions as a form of initiation. It is possible this animal had significance to their culture. We know from later hominins such as the men and women at Chavez that lions were important to them. It is fun to speculate, but in actuality it is impossible for us to know. The lion could have been merely hunted for meat or possibly in self-defense. Whatever the case, it is fascinating to know that this particular lion has a particular story. One fateful day, an inconceivable amount of time ago, a group of humans would slay a beast of claw and fang with a sharp piece of wood. It is fascinating to know that history is made of individuals. Though we apply vague names like cave lion and homo heidelbergensis, all of these animals had lives just as you do right now. This is why it is crucial to learn about these people that we will never truly know. Though limited to fossils, their stories still echo in eternity. Africa was also home to many fearsome predators. Though some of the predators were the same as they are now, a lot of the fauna was different. Crocodiles would have posed a significant threat. Hippopotamus were intimidating, but they may have been prey more than they were a predator. An interesting animal they may have tangled with were the fearsome Dinopithecus. This giant relative of modern baboons could weigh up to 77 kilograms or 170 pounds. Large males would have weighed more than most of the Heidelbergensis they encountered. Baboons are vicious animals that even in their smaller form are known to attack people with their devastating fangs. Words cannot describe how terrifying it would be to encounter an angry Dinopithecus that weighs more than you. A site in Kenya revealed that hominins may have actually seen the baboon kin as prey. The site has the butchered remains of over 90 giant gelata baboons. It is dated to about 500,000 years ago. Typically the site is credited to Homo erectus, but since no hominin remains are known from the site, it very well could have been Homo heidelbergensis. Overall, predators were a dominant fact of everyday life for these people. They were able to defend themselves and even target predators, though toothy beasts certainly contributed to their mortality rate. We do not currently have evidence of cannibalism in this species. Regardless, it can be said that they would have eaten human flesh from time to time. 
The oldest evidence of cannibalism comes from 800,000 year old Homo antecessor remains from Spain. We know that sapiens and Neanderthals both ate their kin from time to time. There are a number of reasons to eat human flesh. Violent conflicts leave meat lying around, and starvation pushes people to extremes. Strange rituals are often to blame as well. Ritualistic cannibalism is actually quite common throughout our own species, and similar behaviors may have been done in the others. Cannibalism was an aspect of life for many ancient humans, and Heidelbergensis would have been no different. To expand in the cold hinterlands of Europe and Asia, Heidelbergensis would have needed to stay warm. Their vast range was also inhabited for a vast amount of time. They went through several ice ages, but occupied Europe all the same. Fire was certainly used to stay warm, but other methods would have been necessary. Clothing would have been a crucial technology for these people. Evidence of clothing itself does not last long. Hides and cordage disintegrate very fast. Other forms of evidence must be considered. Awls and sewing needles are obvious evidence for clothing and sewing. This technology is actually more advanced and only appears within the last 100,000 years. Hide scrapers are the most widespread evidence for clothing. If you have ever killed and skinned an animal, you know how painstaking it can be to remove the fat and flesh from the hide. We know that Heidelbergensis used scrapers at Grand Olina in Schoenigen, Germany. It can be said with reasonable certainty that these tools were used to prepare hides. What we can't say for sure is if they actually wore this hide. Considering they lived in cold climates and they prepared hides, it is not too much of a jump to assume that they would have worn simple clothing. Since many populations of Heidelbergensis probably lacked cordage technology, clothing would have been very limited. They may have simply tied their pelts to their bodies to stay warm, although other more complicated fabrication techniques may have been used. Beyond clothing, shelter would have been very important. In typical hominid fashion, they often lived in caves. But there are only so many caves and some may have not preferred to live in them. Even as far back as Heidelbergensis, humans were making complex shelters. Firm surface huts with solid foundations have been recorded since the Cromerian Interglacial. The earliest example is a 700,000 year old stone foundation from the Czech Republic. This dwelling probably featured a vaulted roof made of thick branches or thin poles, supported by a foundation of big rocks and earth. Other such dwellings have been postulated to have existed during or following the Holstein Interglacial which began 424,000 years ago. These sites were probably occupied during the winter and averaging about 3.5 meters by 3 meters in area. They were probably only used for sleeping, while other activities, including fire keeping and tool making, were done outside. Less permanent tent technology may have been present in Europe in the Lower Paleolithic. Housing is often made of perishable materials, so most of the evidence of their constructions has since faded with the sands of time. It is quite amazing how much evidence for their housing we do have, though. It's not easy to make even a basic shelter. Constructed dwellings with solid foundations are a testament to their intelligence. Another testament to their intelligence would be if they were seafaring. Traveling by sea is a very complicated process, to say the least. So much so that it was long assumed we are the only species to do so. However, evidence indicates that humans may have been seafaring by about a million years ago. No vessels have survived the years, but what has is the evidence of hominins on remote islands. Some islands, such as Luzon, have never been accessible from the mainland. It is 80 kilometers or 50 miles from the mainland. That is not a swimmable distance. Luzon and a variety of other islands have told us that our ancient relatives were certainly utilizing some sort of craft to travel across the water. We know that Neanderthals and Erectus were both capable of this technology. Some Mediterranean islands such as Crete have evidence of Acheulean hand axes that have been dated to as late as 190,000 years ago. Though researchers speculate that they could be much older than the layers they are in. 
They resemble the hand axes made in Africa around 800,000 years ago. Dr. Strasser, a Greek archaeologist, said they could be as much as 700,000 years old. This would mean the maker of these tools was likely Heidelbergensis. If so, this would tell us a lot about their technological ability. Creed is too far to swim to. It would have been a major undertaking to get there. I should note that we currently do not know exactly how old these hand axes are and we should not jump to any conclusions. It is currently believed that they were made by Neanderthals. We don't have any hominin remains from the island yet, just tools. Intelligence can often be observed by the things these people left behind. Moral intelligence can be seen in the remains these people left behind. Injuries and deformities often give us a window into their harsh lives. A male specimen from Cima de los Huesos may have lived for over 45 years. He may be the oldest example of this age demographic in the human fossil record. This demographic would eventually gradually increase in Neanderthals and Sapiens. He did not live all those years without problems, though. His spine was excessively curved and misaligned. He also had Bastrop disease on the L4 and L5 vertebrae. This would have caused him tremendous pain and severely limited his movement. This man would have little use for their society. He couldn't hunt, he couldn't gather, and he wasn't very mobile. His usefulness would have been limited to entertainment, passing on knowledge, and comforting his kin. In all likelihood, he was loved by these people. Even in some modern human populations, the elderly have been killed as we decided they had no further use to society. Hunter-gatherers and people in antiquity alike practiced senicide. But even for archaic human species, we have no evidence that this was the case. Another specimen from Cima de los Huesos provided us with even more evidence about their compassion. An adolescent skull no older than five was diagnosed with lambdoid single suture craniosynostosis. The severity of this rare condition is thought to have caused its death. It would have been obvious to its parents at a young age that it was deformed, though it was kept alive until it eventually died of its deformity. This tells us that despite its problems, these people valued it enough to keep it alive. They spent five years caring and feeding for this child just to let it die. This is another example that the people of Cima de los Huesos were compassionate in a similar way we are today. This should not be too much of a surprise. Multiple species across the animal kingdom mourn their dead. Mothers are especially prone to this behavior for obvious reasons. Homo heidelbergensis is obviously a lot more cognitively advanced than a chimpanzee. The death of a loved one would have certainly been a tragedy for these people. Another way we often measure the intelligence of ancient people is through their art and culture. Symbolism is a very complex behavior that is truly fascinating. Hominins have been making art for hundreds of thousands of years and this includes Heidelbergensis. Though what we consider art is certainly subjective. About 27 Middle and Lower Paleolithic objects have been postulated to have symbolic etching, out of which some have been refuted as having been caused by natural or otherwise non-symbolic phenomena. The Lower Paleolithic art consists of rocks and bones with engravings on them. Some of these pebbles are nearly 400,000 years old. An elephant tibia from Germany has a number of cut marks that cannot be explained by simple butchery. So far, these examples seem to be contemporary to our scribbles in a notebook. These hominins may have just been bored and decided to scratch some rocks together. But fortunately, we do have other, more complex art from these people. Two artifacts that are possibly as much as 500,000 years old are attributed to this species. The Venus of Tan Tan and the Venus of Barakat Ram. For those unaware, a Venus is a figurine portraying a woman. They become common throughout Europe in the Upper Paleolithic but are not known from other periods. Their purpose is poorly understood and we may never actually know what they were used for. The two Venus figurines that have been attributed to Heidelbergensis are also controversial. 
Both of the artifacts were mostly formed by natural processes before hominins slightly altered them into a more human-like shape. Most archaeologists can agree that hominins altered and possessed these objects. What they don't agree on is their interpretation as human figurines. The debate mainly surrounds whether they are symbolic or utilitarian. The objects contain traces of pigment. It has been hypothesized that they may have been used to manufacture pigment, but it has also been thought that they were painted to look more like a human. What I find so fascinating about these objects is assuming that they are supposed to resemble women, then human cultures separated by hundreds of thousands of years decided to make these figurines independently of each other. Fascinating. Early modern humans and late Neanderthals made wide use of red ochre for presumably symbolic purposes as it produces a blood-like color, though ochre can also have a functional medical application. Modern hunter-gatherer societies still find this pigment important for a variety of reasons, including symbolism and medicine. Beyond sapiens and Neanderthals, there is evidence of older red ochre usage. Sites in Tanzania, Ambrona, and Terra Amata have extensive evidence of red ochre. These sites are attributed to Heidelbergensis and Erectus, respectively. The site may represent the emergence of pigment technology as it becomes common later in the Paleolithic. Besides physical art, another feature of complexity is the burial of the dead. In 2006, it was suggested that the Cima de los Huesos hominins were buried by people rather than being the victims of some catastrophic event such as a cave-in. Because young children and infants are absent from the remains, they can't be explained by such a sudden event. Also, the remains are conspicuously associated with a single stone tool, a carefully crafted hand axe made of high-quality quartzite. This has led to speculation about it being some kind of grave good. Supposed evidence of symbolic graves would not surface for another 300,000 years. Considering we know that their descendants buried their dead, it is not too unreasonable to hypothesize the same for this species. However, evidence for burial is quite hard to gather, and the age of the buried individuals is not always enough to come to this conclusion. The Cima de los Huesos humans may have been capable of language. They had a modern human-like hyoid bone and a middle ear bone capable of finely distinguishing frequencies within the range of normal human speech. Remains have indicated that they are predominantly right-handed. Handedness is associated with lateralization of brain function, which is also typically associated with language processing. It is postulated that this population was capable of an early form of language. These traits do not absolutely prove they had language, but certainly provide evidence. They obviously were able to communicate with each other in complex ways, but enough so to be considered a language is the real question. What is important about these findings is that we see that it evolved within Heidelbergensis. This shows that the species truly did make great strides in human evolution. I should note that the Cima de los Huesos hominins are closely related to Neanderthals. And with the new reclassification, they probably are considered Neanderthals now. They are still very close in time to what we would consider Heidelbergensis, but who knows how paleoanthropologists will change the classification of Heidelbergensis in the future anyways. The consensus was that Homo Heidelbergensis was the ancestor to Sapiens, Neanderthals, and Denisovans. However, the reclassification to Bodoensis now puts them as the direct ancestor to Homo sapiens. It is generally thought that our species and Neanderthals had a last common ancestor about 600,000 years ago. So could we call this ancestor Heidelbergensis? Maybe, as of now we do not know if it will receive a name or simply be known as the MRCA. MRCA means most recent common ancestor. The idea was that populations of Heidelbergensis living in Europe evolved into Neanderthals and Denisovans while populations in Africa evolved into Sapiens. And this is still kind of the idea, but instead of Heidelbergensis, it would be the MRCA. Like I previously mentioned, Middle Pleistocene remains in Europe were stocky while the ones in Africa were more lean among other morphological traits. This is why researchers decided to finally make clear terms to describe these differences. 
This new classification only recognizes Bodoensis in Africa and Southeast Europe and early Neanderthals in the rest of Europe. Who knows if the term Heidelbergensis will continue to be used in paleoanthropology. It is a little disappointing that this whole video was made on a species which might not even be recognized anymore, but I believe it was actually a really important lesson in understanding the field of paleoanthropology. It is a very complicated field and people often have trouble understanding the admittedly complicated nomenclature. Homo heidelbergensis, or I guess the MRCA, was an incredible human species. Though they are often overshadowed by Neanderthals and even Erectus, they are essential to the human story. They were the first of many things and deserve to be remembered as great survivors of an archaic world. They never really went extinct, as you could say we are their direct descendants, though I guess now we are directly descended from Bodoensis. Same hominins, different name. Nothing lasts forever and we too are merely a new addition to the hominin family tree. There was a time before us, and there will be a time after us. The information talked about in this video will certainly change with new discoveries. I suspect that a lot of things said in this video about the classification of hominins will change within the next few months. But this is good. Science is like an animal that molds its skin to grow bigger. Constant changes to what we think we know are inevitable, and there is beauty to be found in change. If you noticed any mistakes in the information presented in this video, leave a comment down below and I'll try to answer it. So thanks for watching my fifth installment of the Ancient Human series. This series is undoubtedly the most successful on my channel. I am amazed some of you will sit down for nearly an hour or sometimes even more than an hour to watch my content. The next Ancient Human video will probably be on Homo Naledi, but I'll let you decide that in the community tab. So anyways, I guess I should probably talk about the future of this channel or something like that. I'm in the early steps of some big projects and improvements to my content. I'm actually going to start filming stuff for these videos uh, like you'd see in a professional documentary. I have some film experience and I know some people who can help me out. Right now it's just a matter of funding and planning. This content will probably be available in the next year or so. I think I'm going to make a large project on Neanderthals. I already purchased some beautiful Neanderthal spearheads to which I will mount in an upcoming video. They will serve as props for this project. But I also have to make clothing for Neanderthals, so that's going to be kind of hard. So I am thankful for the support, and trust me when I say I am working every day to make this channel better. So with that, I will end this wonderful project on a truly fascinating human. Bye.